heart understands a different language than the mind. The more you try and use words to explain things to your child, the less he or she will understand what you're trying to tell them. But wrap those words in song, rhyme, or story, and their hearts will understand. Music is the first language the heart recognizes. It's pure emotion. Newborns fuss at dissonance and are calmed by lullabies. It travels to a place in our hearts that words alone cannot reach. Ancient Greek orators had musicians play while they gave their great speeches because they knew the music would carry their messages deeper into the heart. Movie makers know that too. What's Jaws without the music? Try singing Kohans over there when you read the stories of World War I bravery and sacrifice or the battle cry of freedom when you read the stories of the Civil War and see how much more meaningful the events become and how much more connected to the spirit of the time you'll feel. The rhythm of music creates order and helps us hang on to things. How else did we manage to hold on to 26 letters of an alphabet in a particular order or memorize the states of the Union? By the same principle, we can plant spiritual and moral truths in the hearts of our children. I want to be kind to everyone. Give, said the little stream. Whenever I hear the song of a bird or look at the blue, blue sky, I know Heavenly Father loves me. We call the great composers master musicians because they discovered and mastered the rules of music that made it possible for us to feel a depth of emotion that we had never felt before. They even attempted to reveal the very glory of God to the human heart. Handel's Messiah does that for me. I'm afraid we're losing many of those rules that they worked so hard to master. Much of our music has been reduced to three chords and a beat, and sometimes they don't even bother with the three chords. The well-educated heart is familiar and comfortable with classical music because it provides depth of feeling. We acquire the language of music the same way we acquire the language of words, by exposure, so be sure and fill your home with all kinds of music. Next time you do the dishes, maybe you can invite Leonard Bernstein and his entire New York Philharmonic Orchestra to set up in your kitchen and play for you. King Louis would be so jealous. The second language of the heart is images or pictures. There's a reason we give so many picture books to toddlers. It's because their hearts understand them. The heart, the heart thrives on images and will hold on to them for a very long time, sometimes a lifetime. That's why pornography is so dangerous. It can be impossible to rid the heart of those images. This is a painting created in 1885. If you don't know that the ribbon on the man's cap signifies he's an enlisted soldier, the title of the painting will clue you in. It's entitled Listed. When this was first hung in an art gallery, a renowned art critic of the day who was used to looking at art through an analytical eye broke down and wept. Any mother, daughter, wife, girlfriend, or sister who has sent a soldier off to war knows the meaning of this painting. Yet, if you asked me to use words to explain what I was feeling, I couldn't. There are no words that fit. Yet it speaks to our common human experience. By the mid-1800s, master artists had discovered and mastered the rules of art by which they could convey human emotion, heart to heart, and they had a lot in their hearts they wanted to express. But an unfortunate thing happened in the world of art about a hundred years ago. The intellectuals found this era of art that had taken place from around 1848 to about 1920 unsophisticated and sentimental. They despise the storytelling going on in art, and so they erased this whole period of art from the university textbooks and from classrooms across the country. Many museums put much of the art in storage, and a new era was ushered in. No rules. Just express yourself any way you want, and we've got what we've got in the modern art world. 
Well, about 15 years ago, a Columbia University trained art historian, art historian stumbled upon this forgotten art and created the Art Renewal Center to restore and bring awareness to this era of classical realism and to restore and teach the rules that had almost been completely wiped out to a new generation of painters. There are over 80,000 art images on their site, including much of this forgotten art. I've gone through all 80,000 images, and guess who I bumped into everywhere? Mothers. And although sometimes she is barefoot, she isn't miserable or oppressed or trapped. She's content and joyful. She is beautiful. And I found fathers. He isn't unnecessary or bumbling or stupid. He is strong and protective. He adores his children and his children adore him. He works hard to provide for his family. I found sisters with their arms around each other. Families joyfully working together. Children out playing together in meadows. Do you want to strengthen the family? Let these be the last images your children see on the wall before they go to sleep and the first they see when they wake up in the morning. If you go to the drop down menu in the menu bar under Well Educated Heart, you'll see the Art Renewal Index. I've selected over 2,000 of these fine art images that I thought would appeal to children. They're organized like this, with images of family and animals in the first section, imaginative images next, and then fine art images of historical events and scenes around the world. I'll explain the month one, month two thing to you going on here in just a little bit. These fine art images are organized on Pinterest pages like this one, so you can easily scroll through and find the ones that you especially like. If you double click, it will take you straight back to Art Renewal, where you'll find the highest definition images. I encourage you to sign up as a member. Permission is given to print these pictures out for use in your home. For commercial purposes, you'll need to pay, but they are providing such a wonderful service to all of us. I hope that you will um, support them by becoming a member. Using these images, you can create personalized little picture books for your little children to look at. Are you familiar with bear books? These are wonderful little hardbound books in lots of different sizes with blank pages in them. They're only about two or three dollars each, and I can think of all kinds of uses for these. But one use is that you could make a little book of mommies with babies or animals for little children, or other combinations of pictures for older children. Remember, the images impressed on the heart of a child will last a lifetime. Seek out the best to give them. The third language of the heart is poetry. Poetry is powerful because it combines the ordering rhythm of music with the imagery of words. Some call it painting with words. Well-educated hearts always cultivate and tend a little garden of poetry they've learned by heart. Marie Antoinette understood this perfectly. What a resource amid the casualties of life is a well-cultivated mind. One can then be one's own companion and find society in one's own thoughts. This is my book of memory gems. I like the word gem because it brings to mind something that is very small but very valuable, sometimes priceless. A gem sparkles and lasts forever. I think poetry is like that. Poetry refreshes our souls, kind of like stopping to smell the roses, which is why I put that image on the cover of my notebook. Everything I keep in here is something I've memorized or am working on memorizing. I always write in cursive because I read that when you write something in cursive, it makes a deeper impression because it lights up the whole brain, which doesn't happen when you print or type. I really have found that's true. It's a wonderful habit and a source of joy to always have something worthwhile you're committing to memory. A love of poetry starts with Mother Goose. 
Last summer, while I was helping my daughter with a new baby, her fifth little girl, I pulled out a sheet of blank white paper and said to six-year-old Madison, Madison, what's your favorite mother goose rhyme? She thought for a minute and said, hey, diddle, diddle. Okay, where do you want me to write it? Right there, she said and pointed. Her heart was getting a little writing and reading lesson while she watched me form letters and write left to right. We read it together, and then she drew a picture of the cow jumping over the moon and the dish running away with the spoon. We three-hole punched it and put it in her notebook. The next day, Grandma, can we do another one? Sure, which one? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Where do you want me to write it? Right there. Then she ran off to draw her picture. Four-year-old Emma had been watching. Grandma, I want to do that. Okay, what's your favorite poem? Hmm, little Bo Peep, same thing. Three-year-old Andy said, I want to do that. Rain, rain, go away. Nine-year-old Kaylee was watching and said, I want to do that. But she did her own writing and drawing. We didn't do it every day, but after I left, my daughter said, one day Madison got a little impatient waiting for her to finish feeding the baby. So she said, that's okay, mom, I'll just write it. Madison had been a somewhat reluctant writer, but she went and pulled out the Mother Goose book, found the picture of the poem she was looking for, and copied it. Hickory, dickory, dock. What a great way to practice writing and do copy work, and it provides a personal first reading book. Every Thursday, my daughter and her girls have a poetry tea time. They put a tablecloth on the table, pick a few flowers if there are any growing in the yard, put on a little classical music and recite the poetry they're learning to each other while they eat yummy things like warm cinnamon rolls or cream puffs. After they share their poems, my daughter reads to them from a poetry book. It's become a tradition they all really look forward to. As a child's vocabulary grows, you can add in the fourth language of the heart, story. Story is the tool you'll probably use the most in educating the hearts of your children. Story converts words into moving images, which the heart recognizes and then attaches a feeling to it. Often, a story carries us to another place and time where we live the events. Stories help us care. They help us see and interpret life. They can be a powerful force for good in our lives. I recently listened to a wonderful TED Talk given by a young Nigerian woman who talked about the danger of the single story. She illustrated her point by telling of her experience as a college student in the United States. Because of the single story her roommate had of what the African looked like, the roommate wondered how it was that she spoke such fluent English. English is the official language of Nigeria. Was shocked when she pulled out a CD of Mariah Carey when asked about her tribal music and was surprised that she knew how to use a stove. The roommate couldn't comprehend that this young woman from Nigeria could have a father who was a professor and a mother who was an administrator. Think of the problem of attempting to tell a single story of the pilgrims. The story of the spiritual leader, William Bradford, is different than the story of the military leader, Miles Standish, which differs from the barrel maker, John Alden, which differs from the good-for-nothing first man to be hanged in America, my husband's ancestor, John Billington. If you were to make your judgment of the pilgrims by hearing just one of their stories, your view will be distorted and incomplete, even though your story may be true. Only by weaving all their stories together can you have a correct view. And the single story is especially dangerous if your one story doesn't even happen to be true. The fact is, there were Native Americans who were brutally savage and natives who were noble and good. There were white men who were brutally savage and white men who were noble and good. There is not a single story of the founding father, of slavery, of the capitalist, or of Darwin. There is no single story of the Christian or the Muslim or the atheist. There is no single story of America. The only way to get a true and complete picture of anything is to weave many stories together, and each heart must do his or her own weaving. 
E pluribus unum, out of many, one. You cannot see the pattern of a tapestry from a single thread. I'm afraid our schools have been a single story system for a very long time. Crashing and colliding stories are creating all kinds of divisions and conflicts, many of which could be resolved by teaching the art of weaving stories together for a complete picture. Childhood is where we begin teaching the art of story weaving by providing an abundance of stories. It's going to be a lifetime process and our tapestries will become more intricate and rich over time. Along the way, we have to be willing to pull out the threads that we find aren't true. To borrow a scriptural phrase, it's going to require time and experience and careful and ponderous thought. But if we're willing to pay the price, the end result is we are going to raise a generation of children with wise and understanding hearts, capable of making sense of the world they live in and who know their place in it. The well-educated heart cannot be satisfied with picking up one history book, plowing through it, and checking it off the list. Weaving many stories together requires a plan and a rhythm for order. There's a word for haphazard learning. The word is desultory, which means not having a plan or purpose. It means unconnected. Desultory learning, winging it, isn't a good way to go. It makes me think of the weeks I don't make up a menu in a shopping list. Those weeks are chaotic and stressful. Five o'clock rolls around and I'm scrambling to figure out something to cook and I have to run to the store because I don't have the ingredients and by seven o'clock we order pizza. We eat a lot better when I plan. I think Sir Arthur Conan Doyle observed rightly. Desultory readers are seldom remarkable for the exactness of their learning. It's a tiresome way to go over time. But the other extreme isn't good either, where learning is so structured and forced, the child is never allowed to possess, to follow his passions or interests, or where there's never any room for the spirit to work. I've been trying to find a good balance. One popular plan among homeschoolers is a four-year rotation plan, where studies are linked to history. Although I like the idea, there are some features that don't quite work for me. For one, you don't get to American history until the fourth year. I think children need to have a steady stream of stories from their own heritage. But a bigger problem is that you tend to have to firehose information because you're not coming back for four years, which is a long wait in the life of a child. It's hard to retain information that long. And if a child learns Greek and Roman history at age six, you're limited to stories a six-year-old mind can grasp which isn't a lot. Then he'll get some more that are appropriate for age 10, but he will have missed those he could have understood at age seven and eight and nine and 11, 12 and 13 and 15, 16 and 17. I prefer line upon line, here a little and there a little, layering and understanding gradually over time. So I've come up with a modified rotating schedule that rotates around every 12 months rather than every four or six years. Using this plan, I'm going to be able to weave in stories of history, biographies, historical fiction, fairy tales, literature, art, music, scientific discoveries, and other stories in a way that they will all start to connect and interlace. And the great advantage is if you don't get to something one year, it's okay. You'll be back around several times, perhaps over a lifetime, and each time you return, there will be more connecting points to weave around and link to. Your whole family can participate at the same time, but on different levels, and as you do, family discussions will naturally deepen and become more meaningful. I'll show you where you can find this 12-month schedule in a few minutes, but let me first walk you through it. I first divided up the study of American history over 12 months. And then I linked nations of the world to each of those sections. I plan for months 11 and 12 to land in the summer where the study is broad and open. There's a connecting thought for each of these sections. For instance, I linked China and India to Columbus because those are the countries he was trying to reach and it lends itself to learning what was going on in those countries. What was he drawn to? Because month one is about exploration, 
the Vikings will be included, which connects to a study of Scandinavian countries. In month two, in the study of pilgrims, I blinked Holland, because that's where they sought refuge before coming to America. Holland had just freed themselves from Spain's tyranny, so Spain is linked. Everything is connected in some way. This rotating schedule now gives you a framework to start weaving stories on. You'll find lots of overlap throughout. Unfortunately, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to count on your public library to provide all the stories you'll need for a well-educated heart. For a lot of reasons, you're going to want to start putting together your own home library, but that's a good thing. I've heard it said that a book worth reading is a book worth owning. The well-educated heart is about everything lasting, not temporary. The books on my shelves are all like old friends. All I have to do is rub my hand across the back of a book and all the feelings and impressions come back to me. A book returned to the library is out of sight and out of mind. The really good books are worth reading several times. The first time you may read it to find out what happens, but then you keep rereading it to feel all those wonderful feelings all over again. And each time you discover something new. The good news is many of the books I'm going to recommend can often be found at library used book sales, thrift stores, and online very inexpensively. You'll start to feel like you're on a treasure hunt. Digging in big crates of used books looking for the good stuff has become my favorite hobby. And I'll give you a lot of free resources for books as well. I just finished organizing my home library around this 12 month schedule. I've devoted shelves to each month and I suggest you focus on one month at a time as you start feeling filling your shelves. Almost all of my books fit into one of these months except for my nature and science books which is a topic for another day. Science is important to the well-educated heart. I just knew I wouldn't have time to cover it in this presentation. Biographies, movies, informational books, picture books, chapter books, historical books, art, music, historical fiction, all are assigned a month. Sometimes I'll put a book in a certain month because the author is from that country, and sometimes because the story takes place in a particular country. It doesn't really matter which way you go. Now in the next segment, I'm going to share a story resource guide and show you all the notebooks. Mm -hmm.